Welcome to UCR Writers Week 2023. We're thrilled to have you join us today. A few helpful notes in case you've never attended an event on Crowdcast before. When it's time for our Q&A segment, please submit your questions using the Q&A feature, not the chat. Let's give it a minute or two for everyone to join the session. And while we're waiting, let me know in the chat where you're listening in from today. Also, please let us know if this is the first time you've attended UCR Writers Week. And with that, let's get started with our session. Welcome to the 46th Writers' Week at UCR, 46 years of incredible literary presence. We at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Cahuilla, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Further, we offer acknowledgement to the Asian, Latino, and African-American communities who have also built and tended to this city and its surroundings, oftentimes displaced and disenfranchised despite their labor and commitment to the area. It is our third year online, and we couldn't be more thrilled than to offer captions and ASL interpreters throughout our sessions. And this year, we have some on-campus, in-person events for those close enough to attend. We hope that you attend many events this week and spread the news that we are presenting these 33 writers free of charge to all. Pre-registration for virtual events is required, so spread the links as you spread the news. All of the books are available through UCR, Barnes & Noble, and Cellar Door Books online. Please support our authors by buying their books. And following each reading, please stick around for our live Q&A session. With no further ado, we welcome and greatly appreciate everyone here attending this 46th UCR Writers Week Festival. All of our writers presenting, all of our volunteer panel moderators, ASL presenters, and everyone who tunes in to these recordings in the post-festival virtual continuum, and to everyone here attending now, welcome to the 46th UCR Writers' Week Festival. Welcome to the 45th UCR Writers' Week. This session features three amazing writers, Gabriela Jauregui, Angela Peñarredondo, and Boris J. Luke. Gabriela Jauregui is a writer, translator, and editor. Her first novel, Feral, is forthcoming in December 2022 from Sexo Piso in Mexico and Spain, as well as the anthology Tsunami, which is forthcoming from Feminist Press in the U.S. She is the author of Many Fiestas, Gato Negro, 2017, Leash Seeks Lost Bitch, Song Cave, 2016, and Controlled Decay, Akashic Books, 2008, as well as the short story collection, La Memoria de las Cosas, Sexto Piso, 2015. She edited and co-authored two essay collections, Tsunami, Sexto Piso, 2018, and Tsunami 2, 2021. Her creative and critical work has been included in anthologies, journals, and magazines in the US, UK, Australia, Mexico, and Poland, including most recently McSweeney's, Art Forum, Litro, amongst others. She teaches in the English department in the College of Modern Letters at the UNAM, National Autonomous University of Mexico, and lives and works in the forests belonging to the Masahua peoples and the monarch butterflies. Angela Peñarredondo is the author of Nature Felt But Never Apprehended, Noemi Press, All Things Lose Thousands of Times, and Landia Institute, a winner of a Hilary Gravendick Poetry Prize, and the chapbook Maroon, Jemmy Publishing. 
Their work can be found in anthologies and journals such as the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day series, Pleiades, Apogee Journal, Southern Humanities Review, and elsewhere. They are a recipient of fellowships and scholarships from Hedgebrook, Kundiman, Macondo, Vona, Voices Workshop, the Community of Writers, Tin House, and others. They are an assistant professor of creative writing at California State University, San Bernardino. Boris J. Luke is the author of My Hollywood and Other Poems, 2022, editor of 1917, Stories and Poems from the Russian Revolution, 2016, co-editor of The Penguin Book of Russian Poetry, 2015, and translator of volumes by Isaac Babel, Andrei Kirkov, Maxim Osipov, Leo Tolstoy, Mikhail Zoshenshko, and other poems. He is the former editor-in-chief of the Los Angeles Review of Books, and his poems, translations, and essays have appeared in the New York Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement, The New Yorker, Granta, and elsewhere. Please join me in welcoming Gabriela Jauregui, Angela Peña Redondo, and Boris Strelik. Thank you. This is the beginning of my novel that just came out uh, a few weeks ago in Spanish. It's called Feral, which um, in, in English translates to feral, like feral cats or feral dogs. Um, and I'm reading the very beginning of the novel. It's archivists from the future find um, sort of the leftovers of our current day, present day civilization, especially and specifically sort of uh, a bunch of documents and things that uh, belonged to a group of women who lived in a commune. And um, they, we quickly find out one of them was murdered and the other three were trying to find out what happened to her, who murdered her. Um, this is very much the present context in Mexico um, where feminicide is sadly very common. So it, it's dealing with that, but then from the future, from a moment of of hope, but also of survival and um, of transformation. And this is like the most distant part into the future. And the title of this section is The Island. We rise from our slumber. We lick the tips of our fangs. In the heart of the city's center, in the navel of this belly that was once a metropolis and is now a cake ruin, layers and layers of the detritus of civilizations and uncivilized humans, of warriors and those defeated by life, of women of the night, of the ruins of great temples and lesser ones, like La Peninsular, El 33, Huawei's El Internet, Pervert's Lounge, Marrakesh, of lone cowboy boots and time-frayed polyester shirts, of headdresses made from the feathers of the formerly extinct Quetzal, of Tenzontle, of the flowers of Huasontle, of asphalt, of corn, of ajolote and anklets and beads of gold and tin, of old books by new authors and new books by old authors, of rubber stamps and empty tetra packs of a drink called boing, of dentures made with human teeth, of knives with teeth, of 100% cotton socks and flat soccer balls, of hanging sneakers, of tiger striped jock straps, jaguar pelts, and giant speakers that now serve as our homes, of flower water and alarm clocks with their dee 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 forever silent. We awaken. Our burrow is in this underground system of tunnels whose entrance is found under those naciones, a former lesser temple that is nothing but rubble now save for its door. In this tunnel under the street once called Simon Bolivar, named for a hero from their history, which is not ours, at the break of day, at the crack of dawn, no one breaks or cracks us, not anymore. We are mistresses of these streets, of all streets and places, of all doorways, entrances and portals of these 669 blocks of ruins. They all belong to us. Here, we are alpha bitches. Beyond, there are others. But here in this land that is yours and everyone's little pup, you live and learn to walk, learn to swim in this cake island at the center of five lagoons. But first, listen to this tongue that licks your ear, that licks your eyes, to this mother tongue telling you, Listen to your story, the one I sing. Here is your fang-severed umbilical cord. I'm from here. You're from here. From here, we will be. 
We rise from our slumber in the heart of the city's center, in the navel of this belly that was once a metropolis, you are born. From this belly of mine that was all yours, I give birth to you in spring. You've arrived on this earth to sing to the moon, to converse with dusk and with dawn. I sing to you in this tongue as I lick you. I bring you into being, little one, with our mother tongue. Now we awaken, but first we had to emerge from a nightmare, their nightmare. They destroyed tigers and eagles. With their black ink, they erased brotherhood, community, nobleness. You can hear these laments, these songs, these recordings from the past in magnetic tapes and shiny CDs, in these notebooks and obsolete formats, the ghost voices sing. But seven centuries on this earth did not keep our howl from rising to the top of the Torre Latinoamericana, now nothing more than a bent spine. Though it be jade, it cracks. Though it be gold, it breaks. Though it be made in China plastic, it splits, as the ancients used to say. But this bone and fur, they last. Our teeth have torn and will tear yet. Our wild fangs were here only for a while, but that while got a little longer, then longer still. It started with life's a bitch, then moved on to bitches getting down and perreo, humans imitating us. They always wanted to be like us, crazy monkeys, but they never had the courage or the nose to see it through. Listen here, Coyotita. They withered on their own. They yellowed. This time we beat them. Bitches, coyotas, great wolves, all of us. We came back. And so, four by four, like a flower, they dried up here on earth. We flourished. Like cacti, like succulents, we bloomed. We managed our thirst until the center, the navel, the heart filled up again. With blood, then water. With licking pleasure, we drank the blood first. Bitches, coyotas, gray wolves. With this tongue you hear, that scar left from our life inside the belly, the navel, fills with water when we lie face up under the rain. And so this basin filled up again, and that's how we flourished, swimming doggy style. The others went to the place of the fleshless, and we stayed here. We rise from our slumber, my pup, our litters born in burrows, in churches, in pawn shops, under painted murals. We emerged from our slumber when the cages of those little birds opened, those birds that had been our neighbors on the streets, in the hallways, on dusty patios, under roofs of loud tin. When those birds born to extract tiny fortunes printed on colored paper and who died as amulets for human love, flew. They were all flying, flying. The most fortunate bird, the one who pulled fortunes for the women intoxicated in front of a bridal shop window, was the one who announced the lake of blood. From the doorsteps where we'd get kicked in the mornings, we heard her. In the projects and markets and friki plazas, we ran, we rang in her song. It's important. All that is true, all that has roots, shall prevail here. Slumber no more. Listen well, Shokoyotita, to the song of the early risers. We eat what is true. Here in the center, inside the heart, we make our own words and leave our traces, paw prints in the mud. Friends, eagles, jaguars, butterflies, foxes, cyborgs, night crawlers, otters, chicken hawks, hawkers, vendors, and poets, they all went to the place of mystery after drinking from the flowers that intoxicate, the flowers of the rainy season and open corollas. There, the bird jabbered and sang of the place of mystery. We knew how to listen. With our howls and the bird song, we rejoiced. Our howling was heard in the distance, up high near the tips of television antennas and at the northernmost edge. From Alameda to Lagunilla, we rejoiced. From Merced to Miscalco markets, we rejoiced all the way to the Arena Mexico. There we were licking our lips. This whole island is our territory. This land of waste we inhabit our land of cake and lake, the detritus of history on which we leave our mark, make our home. Experience taught us about heels and pointed shoes, about the choke collar. We knew of abuse, of sticks, of tight ropes and pulled chains. Experience taught us about loneliness, 
hunger, about hands holding dry tortillas at the hands of girls, soft petals of the flower that intoxicates. Experience taught us about leftover snout and tripe tacos from Los Cucuyos, the empty shells of river shrimp outside the Danubio. We knew all this and more. We sniffed shit and vomit. We sniffed bellies and guitars in Garibaldi, mezcal spilled like an offering to the ancients, rancid pulque, the scent of gardini. Experience taught us about transparent platform shoes. We licked those feet. We knew the precious anklets. We knew the marches of humans who were as hopeless as we were back then. We shared the warm volcanic zocalo floor and cold doorsteps with them. We knew the swift hum of the subway, that unplumed orange serpent snaking through the entrails of the center in the place of heat and darkness until it slowed to a stop, braked, broke. We sniffed pits. We sniffed sompantlis and wooden rosaries. We watched sinkholes swallow homes and sniffed the heavy dust that rose from the holes. We hid. We slept on the doorstep of history, their human history. The ones who offered themselves up were abandoned, mistreated. They left for the place, the place of the fleshless. Good news for us, bad omen for them. We ate meat, lots of meat. We survived. We endured here on this earth. Then friends came and invited us to pleasure. We were intoxicated together. We bonded, we fucked, we left. We fled, we flew. We became many, multiplied like froth in cacao. We became a pack. Standing among corn and bones, we left. We were born abandoned, so no one orphaned us. We were never separated by a cage. Singers, birds, motley canines, let it be so. Let us raise our song, my little one. Time to rise here. Listen here. May your heart open. Bring your heart close. Take your teat. Do not seek my death cub. One day, soon enough, I will leave for another house, a different doorstep. Doorsteps and door frames remained in the shape of arches, like candles on this cake of ruins, without houses behind them, without housing projects to be entered, without stores, bodegas, bars, or restaurants, nothing more than mere appearance. Thresholds, the essence of the doorstep, our good place on this earth. It is here that we are masters of the close and the together, of the near and dear, of pleasure. They tried to erase us, but it was they who withered. Now we live in the place of their loss, close and together, without the statues of horses, without their DVD and CD cloning machines, without their holy death, their St. Jude, without their virgins, kings, viceroys. This is how we begin to find ourselves. We are coming together. Where shall we go? We will go to rip and tear, my littlest one, my Sokoyota. Like breath, we rise. We sprout like tender green corn. This is how you burgeon forth from the belly, in the navel of what was once called New Spain, or DF, or CDMX, or Anahuac, also known as the Bowl of Cream, or the Great Tenochtitlan. And suddenly, we rose from our slumber, like grass in spring. Open your eyes, pup. We will delight in our song. Feel the cold tip of my wet snout nudging you. Get up. Come on. Go make this giant ruin yours. Piss on it, makes, makes its dust with mud with your urine. Deck the vestiges of older times with your shit. Here, in this time, we share the gifts, food, what gives shelter, doorsteps for all, the land, water, flour, corn, and meat to be ripped. Hear the voices of your pack calling you, urging you on. Come on, run. Our howls rain down like emeralds and egret feathers. This is how we speak. With perfumes and flowers we speak. Feel our pack in your heart. Feel the rhythm of our paws with each beat. Feel your belonging. Become us. Everywhere is your home. Every doorstep in the center. This is your territory. Ours now. Little heart newly sprouted. Inhabit it. Draw a line from Mina to República del Perú, Apartado, Leona Vicario, República de Guatemala, Avenida del Trabajo, Arcos de Belén, and Eje Central, then all the way to Avenida Juárez. Trace the outline of this island in your heart, 
Then paint these streets with your piss, with your florid song. Not in vain are we here on this earth, this land, our flowery patio. Not in vain did we fight to endure in this place of the fleeting moment. Now we awaken and you answer your pack with a howl. And so we rejoice. In the center of this island, everywhere is your home. Here where the many flowery trees stand and where there are no more war drums and no more metal weapons and no more chains. Here in this navel, sing, howl, answer your pack with your newly emerged teeth. With your teeth like bloody needles, at dawn you will emerge from the burrow. It's your turn now, young one. Go out and hunt with your tiny sharp teeth. Tear apart what remains of them. Let them be drenched in blood, those who tried to erase us, separate us. Let us go to their ruins, to their crooked falling buildings. Let us go to their cages, to their useless factories to where they yellowed and wither. In their ruins, you will find them. Bite their heels. When they fall, eat their faces. Eat their eyes, Cocoyotina. Adorn yourself with their necklaces and sharpen your tiny teeth on their ribs until the jacaranda flowers rain down upon you in spring. And we will howl with you. And this excerpt is translated. Um, I translated it for... Um, McSweeney's issue number 65, it's titled Plunder, in case you want to check it out. Um, and thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Angela Pena Redondo. It's great to be here with you. Before I begin reading uh, for my book, Nature Felt But Never Apprehended, on Noemi Press, which will be released in March 2023, um, but available for pre-order now. I'd like to express my thanks to all of you for joining me today and for taking the time to support UCR Writers Week and also Queer Folk Connects Literature. Many warm thanks to Allison Hedge Coke, Tom Lutz, and the staff at UCR Writers Week for including me. I'm very honored to be here and to be part of the 2023 UCR Writers Week and to be reading among many wonderful writers presenting their work uh, with you. So my first uh, piece is titled Mercy Ceremony, and it's the first prose poem that um, that's in the book. And I feel Mercy Ceremony is very much about the ritual of shedding and letting go of one's personal and historical demons. And I also feel uh, this piece sets the tone for the rest of the book. So, Mercy Ceremony. I am slaying you in my dreams. No, slaying you for reals this time. Steel pointed aim like hawk bone at your bare collar. Your eyes tell of those once privileged limbs, that mouth which consumed everything it could because it believed it could with even knowing the immensity. What was once stripped away from me is no longer an invisible assault buried under black tendrils of seaweed havoc of sea grapes. There's nothing holding me back from carving as one does when whittling wood. This butterfly blade on soft tissue to etch my name on your skin. This name for ocean, its secret wind, this tender gouge, jellyfish all cinematic haunting above flaring sea anemone. Black sands of my birth, it's unseasonable foam. You rope bound, covered in lava sediment. I set your weight on a raft just made for your tied up frame. Burn guava leaves above each part stamped in volcanic ash. I hover longer over bandaged eyes, wrinkled genitals, 
moistened pod now, waiting to return to the undulating underbelly. Blow smoke into your one exposed ear so you can feel my life force one last time. Like intentional stars colliding as I push your raft off into what's destined to consume you. So this next piece that I'll be reading is very much inspired by interdisciplinarity. And what I mean by interdisciplinary is that my creative research, uh, my creative work, my writing is inspired by other sources and mediums outside of the literary arts. And this piece was very much inspired and, and informed by the film, Markova Comfort Gay, which is a Filipino film that was written by Claudio Del Mundo Jr. and directed by Jill Portes. And this is titled, Letter to Streets That Burned You. Dear Ungiven Name, One Who Has Been Heard, if tied by a rope, if paired with glass, if adorned in tectite. Dear sunburst of whipped black wigs, emerald sorry starlets at the Subaki nightclub on the corner of Mabini Street. Dear Manila at dawn, Ask the soldiers why they imprisoned you in barracks now the Rizal Sports Complex. Dear golden gaze of Pasai, you know what's God like, sugarcane field dandies, bitter melon buckglass, queens in violent eyeshadows. Dear bar girl in a fish tank, Nipple fringes rage to swaying hosannas. Pinwheel earrings shine as still empty hands cupped. Dear Minerva, Carmen and Sophie, barn your death before sunlight. They cut grass on their knees, gatherers of their own hair. Applaud their femme bodies, anoint them where they lay. Dear black market healer, even blindfolded, you're much more than others realize. Fingers clasping shape of infinity, but someone made you believe mouths the limit. This third piece is titled on cures and abrasions from a responsive environment. And it is very much um, a piece that is informed uh, by climate change and its connection with Western capitalism. Um, the eruption of the Ta'al volcano in the Philippines also very much informed this. So on cures and abrasions from a responsive environment. What was once wild chicken and pig farms, once hectares of pineapple fields, banana, coffee, cacao, rice, corn, now inedible, unlivable density. From village to village, she tramples. Her land extends beyond parameters, families and homes washed by volcanic ash. It rains like this in abundance into her briny tinctures, futurity and ashfall bond in her throat, concepts from their survivor, blast after blast, chopped, burned portions of earth, shelter, an architecture of, of fallen switches, from her hands, herbs she rinses into all's ruined lake. If not from the violence of water, then fire. 
capitalism having already found a way to turn profit on disaster. She formulates teleportation devices out of root bark, what empire identifies as poor, as docile. Does surveillance mean the same as command? Remember what it's like to be of this deserving place. She continues to scan for any of the living birds through the barrel of her sugarcane stock. Technology against incendiary epistemes. She wipes down the fevered, makes what's bruised aromatic. Thank you again for listening. And again, it's an honor to be reading with you all today. And so this last uh, piece that I'll be reading from, <clears throat> from my book, Nature Felt But Never Apprehended, is titled Induction in Self-Loyalty. One, hollow out a small patch of earth, the width of a spinnaker. Two, observe a pattern in the flood. Three, become stone in a gale. Four, dive as an albatross seizing food that sears where sap flowed. Five, learn multiple rituals of femme audacity. Six, abandon pretty in their arroyo. Seven, seize desire without others. Eight, peel another layer of spectral radiance for every intimate question. Nine, allow each empty part to be driftwood. 10, return in any order or fashion, but honor the return. Thank you all for listening. Hello, my name is Boris Draluk, and uh, I'm going to read a few poems from a collection of poems uh, that I published uh, this year uh, called My Hollywood. Um, and uh, most of these poems that I'll read today are in one way or another connected to Los Angeles, which has been my home for um, some 30 years. Um, and uh, a great many of them uh, were uh, written over the last four or five years uh, and uh, are reflections on my relationship to Los Angeles and its past. Um, the first poem I'll read um, carries an epigraph, uh, which... Um, is um, typical of some of these poems uh, uh, torn from the headlines. Um, this one is from the Los Angeles Times, and um, it uh, describes um, uh, this poem in this epigraph, um, a bargain store um, uh, that used to stand on uh, Les, uh, La Brea uh, and uh, is now a 99 cent store. But it had a lot more character in the 1990s when my family first emigrated uh, to Los Angeles um, from the former Soviet Union. Yeah. Bargain Circus. So it goes at Bargain Circus, perhaps LA's most whimsical discount store. The eclectic selection of goods and guilt-inducing low prices draw a melange of Orthodox Jews, Russians, Armenians, and West Side connoisseurs. Los Angeles Times, 1997. Clown prints of bargain shops, those penny ante Xanadus that take up half a block was the La Brea Circus. Huge barn shock full of overstock, a poor man's horn of plenty, where we, though broke as sparrows, like canaries, flitted about, whistled with disbelief at deals, no steals that would abash a food, big pens for nickels, dollar dictionaries. I wore my Webster's out, clumsily wooing the tongue in which I sing this dime store's praise. But there worn, too, my memories of those days, like VHS tapes after years of viewing and spooling backwards to the sweetest spot. Oh yes, that was another thing we bought, a plastic sports car VHS rewinder. So obsolete, so perfectly designed for its vanished purpose, like a streamlined hearse, inexorably heading in reverse. 
the next poem I'll read is about the architecture of Los Angeles. Um, for many years, and especially during the um, first wave of lockdown um, under COVID, I noticed that the bungalows um, that I so loved, um, that were so, uh, to my mind, uh, symbolic of California living, um, were being knocked down uh, en masse. Um, and the, the objects going up in their places had, uh, to my mind, much less character than the bungalows um, they were replacing. Uh, the poem is called The Passing of the Bungalows. The epigraph is uh, from uh, a book on the California bungalow, a very good book. The bungalow courts extended at least a touch of casual California living, even to the core. Robert Winter, The California Bungalow. They held their courts from here to Pasadena, not in regalia, but in plainer clothes, withholding judgment on our misdemeanors, warm, down-to-earth, arrayed in close-knit rows, no hint of hauteur to these Swiss chalets, these beaming tutors, Spanish hideaways that dignified us with lanyaps of style, crown molding, cup awning, clinker tile. Fair bungalows, now your dominion comes to closure. I watch swaths of you demolished in favor of the featureless and polished plutocracy of condominiums. Your bold agaves, fierce, protective aloes, lay down their spears beside the realtor's gallows. Now, I, I, I did live in a bungalow briefly. Um, it was a very nice bungalow and a very nice time. Um, but uh, most of my um, young adulthood, I, I spent in a different kind of uh, typically Californian structure, which is the dingbat apartment building, uh, much maligned. Um, and uh, this poem, uh, pays homage uh, to the charms of uh, the dingbat. Uh, it's called Close to Home. And this is the epigraph. The dingbat typifies Los Angeles apartment building architecture at its worst. Leonard and Dale Pitt, Los Angeles A to Z. Some years ago, I learned they call them dingbats. These proud but shambly veterans at rest who lean on carport columns as on muskets, one tarnished decoration on each chest a rust red star or an abraded crest. An ugly name, it makes me feel indignant on their behalf. Haven't they done their best to serve with honor? Can they not be trusted to guard the tempest-tossed, the dispossessed, the migratory species of the West? Their rooms, unfurnished, furnish everything that we birds of paradise require for a nest. So what if half the cabinets are busted, the front door warped, the carpeting distressed. Fly free. They will not hold you. You're their guest. The following poem I wrote very shortly after the start of lockdown, um, when I happened to find myself on uh, Hollywood Boulevard in the middle of the day uh, uh, to see it eerily deserted. Um, there wasn't a single person on the street, which is very unusual um, and uh, uh, quite striking. And um, I took a stroll uh, in my mask down uh, the boulevard um, and stopped briefly at an alleyway uh, called Artisan's Patio, uh, which if you haven't seen it and, you, and you're in Los Angeles, it's worth um, having a look. Um, it was built in the 19 teens and, and uh, the little doorways that align the alley um, are now uh, mostly souvenir shops, but um, at the very end of the alley is uh, one of the oldest memorabilia stores in Los Angeles. Uh, so uh, the poem is called Universal Horror. And the epigraph is from March 19th, um, 2020, a report um, on KABC. Hollywood Movie Posters is the oldest memorabilia store in the world located in the same location with the same proprietor. You can find a shop tucked away in Artisan's Patio, an alleyway off of Hollywood Boulevard. All through the first great war to end all wars, the siren addled nights of its successor, up till last week, the sun-baked, time-warped doors of one slim passage welcomed every passerby. High noon, yet no one passes by. Magnetic trinkets draw no tourist's eye. Moats build tracked housing, in the grooves of vinyl, an eerie calm prevails, not tomb-like, shrinal. 
I come for solace. Far and back, the trains hold universal monsters safely penned. Vampires, mummies, wolfmen, every friend of anxious childhood, surest of vaccines against the grown-up world's uncertain horrors, which spread like scentless, soundless fog before us. And um, this poem uh, is dedicated to uh, the um, people who, with great skill, uh, make uh, small things uh, perfectly well. Um, it's called the Minor Masters. Um, I love the notion of uh, minor perfection and, and uh, um, the status of minor poet is something to which I uh, aspire. Uh, so um, these people are emblems of uh, uh, that aspiration for me. The Minor Masters. On Santa Monica, I know someone who etch forms of a hair's breadth in a rubber stamp. No moles or lasers, just the human touch. If darkness overwhelms an heirloom lamp, head west on Beverly and east of Kings, you'll find hair points Prometheus. If age brittles a book, on Cahuenga, there's a man who'll bind its outcast leaves. Such people make things look immune to time and innocent of pain, intact, immaculate, as none of us remain. Long live the masters whose quaint crafts are holy. They work in solitude, now by appointment only. The book, um, My Hollywood, also features a number of poems um, that I have translated uh, that were originally written in Los Angeles by Russian-speaking emigres um, of decades past. Um, uh, one of these emigres uh, is named Vladimir Korvin Piotrovsky. Um, uh, he had a harrowing life, uh, as many of these emigres did. Um, in um, the late 19-teens, he fought against uh, the Red Army uh, as part of um, the Imperial uh, Army, the White Army, uh, uh, in the Russian Civil War, was taken prisoner and escaped um, by the skin of his teeth. He wound up in Berlin and then Paris. Uh, in Paris, during the Second World War, he was part of the resistance uh, and um, uh, was taken prisoner by the Gestapo uh, uh, and uh, miraculously um, survived and, and uh, was freed after the end of the war. Uh, he spent the last of five years, four years of his life in, in uh, California in the early 1960s. And in this poem, he imagines um, a return uh, to uh, uh, what was then the Soviet Union, if not in life, then in death. Um, uh, so this, po this poem is set um, on a, uh, a ship, um, a cruiser um, that sails from Los Angeles back to the Soviet Union. It's called Exile's Return. To perform a final honor, a sleek cruiser from Kronstadt sails into the silent harbor slowly like a juggernaut. Ready for its distant journey, taking leave of foreign lands, comes a lightweight coffin swaying through a sea of lowered heads. Were we right or wrong? No matter. Flags at half-mast on the stern, with its scrap of Russian glory in the hold, the vessel turns. Such great heights, such depths below. Joyful foam sprays everywhere, and a farewell siren bellows lonely in the azure air. All those stars and all those countries, the return he had long sought, a thick northern fog and gorges the thin-throated Karagat. As it nears the Gulf of Finland, through the Baltic, drizzly, dull, waves, serene yet unrelenting, beat against the cruiser's hull. In the brief glare from the lighthouse, they rise up and pass away, Clouds and islands, clouds and islands, lots of smoke, a barren cave. The last poem I'll read is a translation from um, the work of, of Lysislav Ellis, who was another Russian-speaking emigre um, who was raised in, in Ukraine uh, in the 1930s. His uh, brother and father were arrested and killed in Stalin's purges. Uh, he was then called up uh, to serve in the uh, Soviet army uh, fighting against the Germans, but was taken prisoner. He spent the year, the years of the war, um, uh, working on German railways uh, as a highly trained engineer, uh, and after the war, uh, wound up in a displaced persons uh, camp. Um, luckily, uh, he uh, was able to stay in the West uh, because had he returned to the Soviet Union, he surely would have been executed. And he spent um, the last decades of his life in California. This is a poem that um, uh, takes as its inspiration the landscape 
of uh, California where every kind of uh, plant can grow, uh, but not all plants thrive. And uh, here he plants um, a, a tree, a birch tree, which is um, very much um, symbolic of um, the East Slavic lands, um, but it doesn't, doesn't really uh, find a home here. It's called a Mexican birch. We disfigure nature to, to disrupt life's flatness. I plant a little birch tree beside a prickly cactus and instantly regret it. How I mourn for her, an orphan in the desert, a spindly foreigner. She'll dwell here, never hearing spring's lighthearted song. Heat slayed her catkin earring, barely burst, now gone. Fearfully, her slender trunk bends with the wind. All migrants understand her. It's hard without a friend. Thank you very much. Hi again, everyone. I'm Carlina Perna, and I'm here to moderate our Q&A session. Thank you so much, Angela, Gabriela, and Boris. I want to make sure that you all get a chance to talk to each other and to our audience. And audience, please submit your questions in the Q&A, not the chat. This allows everyone to vote for questions they'd like to hear answered. We will try to get to as many as possible. To get us started, I will ask our writers, in your words, what is a poem or what does a poem do? Um, Angela, can I pick on you to start? <laughs> sure, you can definitely pick on me. <laughs> Happy to start and be the sacrificial starter in this Q&A. Um, so what is, a, what is a poem for me or what is a poem, what does a poem do? That's such an elastic question, I think, for me. Um, at this moment, um, I'm thinking of a poem as, you know, as, 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 a, as a form, as an art of storytelling, um, as this mode, a uh, cultural mode, um, uh, genre of cultural, or that demonstrates or that expresses some kind of cultural production as well, right? Which is also uh, very much what a story does as well. Um, I think at these times, um, a poem also, because it is, it is a story, it is a demonstration of cultural production because it is also at times an archive of memory and, 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 and historical memory that it's also technology in some way. And, and, and I think in so many ways, we, exp we experience that technology happening right now um, uh, that feels like it's been forever, but it's also really, really recent. But I, I'd like to also say that, that, that a poem is also technology. And, um, and so it does all the things in terms of, um, you know, reaching out and, and engaging with listeners, with audiences, and also this very deep, an emotional and at times painful engagement with the self. And, uh, and so, yeah, and it's also this in incredible imaginative leap into like future and past and, 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 and its relation to the fantastic and also to the grotesque, which I love. <laughs> I love all of that, so. I like that response very much. I'm actually not sure that I'm visible. Uh, all I see is a blotch of color, but uh, if you can hear me. <laughs> we can hear you. Okay, I'm terribly sorry. I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, speaking of technology going wrong. Um, well, um, I, I do. I like what you said, Angela, very much about um, uh, poetry being a kind of technology. And one of my favorite contemporary poets, Don Patterson, calls uh, each poem a little machine for remembering itself. Uh, and I've, I've always thought of poems as uh, vehicles of preservation. And um, uh, one of the reasons that I'm drawn to um, traditional devices uh, is, is because they are time-tested 
uh, tools of preservation, um, you know, rhymes and, and meter and, and music um, stick with us a little bit longer um, than some other forms of communication. Um, so I, I'm constantly drawn to those. Great, thank you so much. Gabriela, did you want to speak to the question as well? Sure, I I love what both of my colleagues just said. Um, and um, thank you for that, Angela and Boris. I was thinking, yeah, uh, poem is techne, is a thing made that, and a thing that helps us live in the world, but also poem is archive. Um, and I guess that to answer your question, Carlina, or, you know, sort of it's a hard it's a hard question um i i feel like each poem um also asks and hopefully answers that question in itself like the poem is the question and i guess if it's successful it's also the answer to what the poem is which means that almost each poem is is its own definition code, hopefully Awesome. Thank you so much. And Boris, we can see you now. I, I, I yes, I refine my technique. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Um, I'm going to move into the Q&A where some questions are posted and some folks are already voting on the questions. Um, the next question is, can you share more about your process of writing in multiple languages and or how do the questions, how do the languages you embody and work in interact with one another? I can pick on someone or someone can jump in. Well, uh, I can jump in, I, I suppose, just to, to fill the silence, um, uh, which I do uh, sometimes by rambling. Uh, the, uh, I, don't, I, I write exclusively in English, but I do work with uh, other languages. I'm a translator, largely from Russian, but also from U Ukrainian and Polish and other languages. And um, uh, I feel that um, uh, translation has always been a vital workshop for me. I, I um, uh, have learned so much from the authors uh, who, whose work I've labored to uh, bring across into English. Um, and I, I find that uh, when I do sit down to write, especially after translating something quite powerful, uh, a ghost of that voice lingers uh, in me. And um, uh, in a number of poems, I, I even try to keep that voice alive past the uh, final page of whatever translation I was working on. Um, so uh, I, I do feel that I'm inhabited by, by these, these other voices, but they're voices that I've built around the, the voices in the original. I can say that. Thank you so much. Um, Gabriela, can I turn to you next? Sure. Um, I also work as a translator, but I also translate myself, which is like a different I think, I don't know, but it probably lights up a different part of my, in my brain somehow. Um, and I, it's a weird, to me, it's a, it's a weird and also a happy sort of strange relationship uh, working in, especially in Spanish and, and English, um, because I had to sort of unlearn yeah. Spanish to learn English and to be able to, to work and go to grad school, etc. in the U.S. And I did publish my, my first book of poetry in English. And then when I moved back to Mexico, I had to sort of do that same same sort of uh, work, but in reverse and come back to Spanish, which is, isn't, isn't my, my mother tongue, I guess, in a way, and, and sort of revisit it from that space of, of distance, but also that allowed me to sort of um, love it again, or, or, you know, it also freed me from the sort of weight of tradition in that language and so on. But it was also, you know, it was a hard thing to do, um, to sort of come back and, and sort of relearn and how to properly do certain things in grammar, th th very basic things like that. Um, when you're that when you're writing, you really have to, you know, pay very close attention to and and actually translating uh, was very helpful for me 
in those two backs and forths. And it's also very helpful for me still to sort of keep both both languages alive in my brain. Um, and and I guess uh, one of the que- like a question that someone asked me was like, what language do you dream in? And I guess it also depends. It's also very linked to a sense of place. So it's, Mm -hmm. yes, I'm like traveling back and forth between the two languages, but also wherever I'm living in, you know, informs that the the closeness and the the depth uh, in, in each one of those languages. So right now, of course, then I'm like, this with Spanish and then a little more distant with English. Uh, But, you know, it just fluctuates. And then right now, because we're speaking in English, my brain is like, okay, okay, rewiring, rewiring. (laughs) So, so yeah, it's an ongoing, I guess, back and forth, tug of war, loving embrace. I don't know, all of the above. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Angela, did you want to speak to this question or... Boris, if you wanted to chime back in. Sure. Um, I first wanted to say, like, it was really just really lovely to hear um, Boris and Gabriela talking about their relationship um, with language, especially as as translators. And for me, not, you know, I, I'm not a, a translator or it's something I don't I don't specialize in translation, but I do have I, I do have moments or have had experiences where translation uh, played a part in my work. Uh, one of the most recent experiences is. Um, this piece in, in the book uh, that's coming out um, titled Al- um, Albularia. And Albularia is, uh, you know, it's the way it's spelled is, so, is this creolized version of, 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 of Arboleria, you know, or like, or this, uh, you know, uh, shamanic medicine, uh, fo- uh, you know, folk, folk medicine uh, practitioner. And um, I had it translated into um, a, a Filipino dialect where, um, from the islands in which I was born, which is the Visayans, and so um, it was. It became more of a really collaborative um, project, you know, and which was surprising at the time. And at that time, I was also really nervous because, like many people, you know, I am I am first generation immigrant, and, and you know, the relationship between your original language, right? Is, is quite fraught and, and at times erased due to you know colonization and and the violences of um, of assimilation right and so c- going back to that and having this this poem translated in um, in Visayan and, and thinking about like what kind of Visayan dialect um, I wanted to work in and so um, I collab- I ended up collaborating with my family with my mom and um, and some of her friends, which is my like my my distant titas, my distant distant aunties, and um, it became this really interesting collaboration where we had to work with uh, uh, Ilongo, which is a, the dialect from the city I'm from, Iloilo City, and also Hiligaynon, which is uh, a, a, another um, Visayan dialect, but it's used in uh, when translating literature. Mm. And it's more of a formal kind of dialect for literature and for publication. So it actually took this collaborative. It was a tra- it was a translation collaborative project that involved four different people, and so there was this ongoing conversation between me and four other people about how to get it as close to sort of the core and tone and and messages within within the piece. And it was really. It was really um, humbling for me. Um, it, it forced me to, to 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 look deeper, you know, within my own shortcomings and my own um, sort of severed and 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 now kind of sort of healing relationship with with my language, but also like the incredible nuances that I uh, of of those languages of, of those dialects and tonalities that I have a very that that are you know really complicated but it was also really beautiful and just like aesthetically i think and i don't and and maybe gabriella and boris feel the same way sort of like this aesthetic relationship that when you see language or text you know written outside of english right and it's a it's a different experience i think when you see when you see that in in some kind of way aesthetically and it, it does speak to different parts of your brain um, of, of how it's laid out and 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 the, the lettering and the alphabet and 
and all these things. So it was a really worthwhile experience. And I hope that I get to do more of that again. And so hearing all the responses in terms of translation was um, was really lovely. So thank you. Thank you. That sounds like a beautiful project. <laughs> Thanks, Boris. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you brought collaboration or the topic of collaboration into um, the conversation because that relates to the next question. Um, in in your writing, in your teaching, and any other creative work, creative other creative forms that you that you work in, um, what does collaboration look like in your practice? Um, Gabriella, did you, do you want to start off on this one? Sure, I'm I'm happy to do that. Um, I love collaboration. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that the what Angela just described speaks to how how important that can be and and it's not even necessarily collaboration between you know colleagues and peers but also a collaboration that extends to a community um and to me like people uh you know tend to say that writing is such a lonely or you know practice that you that is very much about the one person in front of the one page or whatever um and and the more i think about it the more i tend to disagree with that I mean, I think that we are always writing with our ghosts and with our peoples and our ancestors and our, you know, our titas or our uh, grandparents or you know, in in case of in the case of migrant writers with all of that um, and all that that entails, uh, the pain but also the beauty and the you know dislocation and all of that. But and I think that we're also in dialogue with a bunch of other uh, texts and writers. And to me, at least, that's why. I write I because it's not uh, this thing of me alone looking at my navel and being like, oh, so interesting. <laughs> you know, it's more like a way of of um, of being with the world or of trying to ask questions of others or being in dialogue with others. So that's sort of a more broad like, OK, this is my like how I view writing as collaboration. But then I've also had the, the, the good fortune of writing collaboratively. I wrote a book um, with three other friends and we all sort of uh, borrowed and deauthorized from each other's, you know? And, and I've been a part of new writer collectives where we also tend to do that or people, you know, where you write prompts for each other or write collectively or sit down in collective writing sessions, a bunch of um, exercises and experiments that have to do with writing and collaboration that have really, um, I think, inspired and also transformed the way I approach writing and my writing itself. Um, and I also love polyphonic writing. And Angela mentioned you know, that she also takes from other, um, sorry, they also take from other uh, genres, not just literary arts. And I think that that's also a way of thinking collaboration and writing with people who aren't necessarily writers or writing with other uh, companion pieces. So all of that, I think, um, I, I enjoy about collaboration, sort of broadly speaking, in, in my practice. Thank you so much, Boris. Can I call on you to jump in? As long as I can unmute. There you go. Can you hear me now? No? Nope. Yeah, we can. Yes, you can. Good. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree with everything that Gabriella said. Writing doesn't have to be a, a lonely endeavor. I think um, there is a part of it that is somewhat lonely, but, but in a, a contradictory way, uh, be, because I think most people who write do write for an unknown audience, uh, uh, ultimately. We write for people who aren't there in the room with us. Um, there's, there's somewhere else. But we also have people in mind, very concrete people, uh, to whom we wish to communicate or whom we wish to please. And uh, if I didn't have that group of three or four or five readers uh, who give me encouragement, I don't think I'd be able to uh, continue doing what I do. And that encouragement doesn't have to be very detailed. Sometimes it is. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. But um, you know, if you're casting your work out into the great unknown, it helps to have a little bit of a layup. And those people are, are the ones who give me that layup. Uh, they're very important to my process. And of course, as a translator, uh, I, I called it a, a kind of a workshop. And it is a workshop. You're not only working with 
this author who may be living, who may be deceased, in a constant conversation with that author, um, who is judging you uh, and judging every step that you you you, you take. Uh, but um, it is much more common, I think, for translators to share their work and workshop their work with colleagues, and that has uh, really taught me how how to be open to um, critique, uh, open to suggestions and to put the text first, to put the work first, rather than my own ego. Um, and that's something that, that working with others uh, uh, can do for an author. Totally. Thank you so much, Boris. Um, Angela, do you have more words that you want to share about collaboration? Um, if not, we can, we'll can move into the last question. Um, sure. Um, I think I'm just going to... Uh, just echo what uh, Boris and Gabriela said um, in so many ways, like th there is so much of what they said that I completely agree upon in terms of the various entities of who you can collaborate with, whether they are living or past or imagined. And and also the the that collaboration also involves like a, 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 also a, a more than one person more, or more than two people. Um, but there was one thing I think that Boris touched upon that I thought was really interesting that I could relate with is um, kind of this um, when you when when you're in relation, you know, collaboration really deals like being in relation with others and being in communication and understanding with others. And that's not always it doesn't always flow perfectly or harmoniously. I think collaboration involves a lot of negotiation and um, and a practice in negotiating and listening, right? And um, I'm, I'm gonna bring just one personal experience from the book. There's some visual work in there and that's the collaboration with the visual artist, Claudia Torres Ambriz. And it was, it involved like um, work, uh, collaborating with a visual artist and, and, and sort of incorporating like a three-dimensional sculpture that became a two-dimensional thing and that involved my text and there was so much negotiation because I was dealing with work that already had a life and history and and that was that had a you know very political and personal connection with the visual artist and now is was being transformed and hybridized into something that was overlapping or or, or being aligned with my vision or or what have you so I think there's a lot of negotiation that's involved but also a lot of improv, right? You can't always predict what will happen, what will be the outcome of collaboration, even though me being a, a total control freak, you know, um, in my own like messed up way, <laughs> but um, that, um, that you never know what the outcome will be. And so it also involves this element that's very organic and, um, and kind of a letting go, a letting go also of control, which is, uh, uh, there's contradiction there, but you kind of live in that, in that, in that liminal space, I guess. That's great, thank you so much. Um, we'll move into our final question, which is, do you have any advice for emerging writers? Um, and Boris, can we start with you? Oh, sure, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I think that um, the, the cliches are all true, don't give up, uh, keep working, <laughs> and I can, I can keep repeating those ad nauseum. Uh, uh, but I, I do think that the the the, the key is um, to read the things that sound like what you want to sound like. Uh, find find your voice in the in the voices of others when you're just starting out, uh, and then do try to imitate them because that that is the the way you start, and you will find that you won't be able to imitate them perfectly. That distance between the thing you admire and what you sound like is not something that you need to bridge. That's, that's your voice emerging. So then work on that voice. Take it in whatever direction you feel it needs to, it, it, it needs to have you follow it. And um, um, you know, keep, keep referring to the things that inspire you, the things that, that you really want to sound like. Um, um, and it seems unreachable at some points, at least for me it did. It seemed completely unreachable that I would ever write anything that's as good as the things that I loved. Uh, but crawling toward that or clawing toward that um, is what got me to the humble place where I am now. Thank you, Angela. Can we have you step back in? Sure. 
Um, thanks for that, Boris. I, I wish you were around and told me that when, you know, um, when I was writing. That would have been fantastic. Um, so I guess with that said, uh, my advice to emerging writers is, um, <laughs> and, and it's funny me saying this because I still feel like emerging in, in some kind of way, um, but um, um, I would say that I think it's extremely important to to seek out and to um, embrace um, the other writers and people and artists and cultural producers that support you. I think we live in, you know, um, we constantly live in a time, in a, in a world, in a place where there's there's a lot of uh, forces out there that are telling you not to do something or or hindering you. And and certainly when you're writing your own narrative or when you are creating your own narrative or reimagining it, it can be really challenging and it can be scary. And so um, I always say it's sometimes you just have to let those other people who who don't like your work or who don't understand your work um, to kind of, you know, kind of boot them out of there and and bring in the people that 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 are that 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 understand and appreciate your language that appreciate that appreciate and understand your your creative research um and there's nothing much more empowering than having an encouraging and generative um community and whatever that community looks like whether it's you know, whatever that chosen community looks like for an emerging writer, I, I totally support. And so, yeah, that's what I would like to offer. Thank you so much. Um, Gabriela, can you join us back in? Sure. I think I, I would piggyback on what both Boris and, and Angela just said. Um, I think that finding your community has also has to do with finding those works that are in dialogue with your own and finding your voice through the voices of, of those works and those people who may or may not be around anymore. But then also, to me at least, it's been crucial to find those that group of people who who you read and they read you back. You know, that it's, it's a sort of whatever you want to call it, sort of informal workshop or, or, you know, just find a few readers and they don't have to be writers. They could be, you know, I don't know, whatever, aspiring filmmakers, just, uh, artists, uh, visual artists or whatever. And and you can go check out their work and, and think through their work with them. And then they can do the same for you in your, in your texts. And to me, that's the most important thing, I think, um, to find that sort of community and and sort of nurture it back and forth uh because it also it becomes like a generational thing um i think um and it doesn't mean that you don't have a difference in ages and backgrounds and so on like i said it can be a diverse group but just a group that you you know exchange back and forth with is completely um necessary especially in a world that tells you constantly, you know, it's a very sort of patriarchal and um, problematic thing to say, you know, grow a thick skin, you know, be invulnerable to criticism, etc. So, yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know how useful the, that kind of advice is. So maybe it's more like, yeah, find your crew and, and you know, have your barrio get, have your back kind of, and you, and you have their back. Thank you so much. I think that was super helpful advice. Um, we're going to close out the session now. Um, thank you again, Angela, Gabriella, and Boris. Um, thank you to Eliza as well for your presence today as ASL interpreter. And to the audience, we hope you've enjoyed your time with us today. As you know, our goal is to keep Writers Week 100% free to attend. We couldn't do that without the generosity of our donors. If you got something of value out of today's session and would like to make a gift to show your gratitude, you can do so by clicking on the bot clicking on the button at the bottom of your screen. Gifts of all sizes are appreciated and everything given will help to support our next Writers Week Festival. And finally, thank you to the audience for joining us. We hope to see you in the next session.